name's Dawson Tide. I am one of the uh, uh, leadership fellows for Connected Communities, the program. And I thought, actually, I usually put this slide up because it's useful just to put um, Connected Communities in the context of the Arts and Humanities Research Council and HRC's other um, priority areas, themes, and programs that it runs. And these are translating cultures, care for the future, science and culture, digital transformations, and the newest one, AHRC Commons, which was established last year. Each of these has uh, to, to offer some leadership and direction to a, a leadership fellow, uh, but Connected Communities has two. And that's because we're the largest program and probably the most complex of all of these. Um, and uh, we, the two of us, well, there's me looking younger. That was taken when I started out as a leadership fellow. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a bit grey in that. And, uh, and then um, also there is Kerry Facer, who's Professor of Education at the University of Bristol. And lots of you are probably know Kerry. She's the other leadership fellow. Connected communities, how to keep informed and to contribute. We have a very active website. There's a screen grab from it. We have a disk mail list, which is also very active. There are, you know, two or three announcements, and they're all interesting ones. There's, we don't have any boring stuff on there. And then, uh, so please do sign up if you're not already signed up to it. And um, um, we've got um, a, a Twitter feed as well, which is actually at AHRC Connect. And each of those is a good way of finding out about the program and about all the activities across it. Connected Communities, this is from our blurb, it's a cross-council program led by AHRC in partnership with four other RC research councils and a range of other organisations such as Heritage Lottery Fund to understand the changing nature of communities in their historical and cultural context and the value of communities in sustaining and enhancing our future quality of life. That's what we said at the beginning of the program and sometimes I sort of think we still do that. What is a community for us on the program? Well, we're not telling anyone what community is because we think we've left the definition of a community partner uh, deliberately, and we think healthily, open. Um, so if you, have a, um, if you either are a community partner or think of yourself as one, or, or you have a, um, a project that you want to submit for, then um, you tell us what your community partner structures are, mm -hmm. organizations, or individuals, and it could be anything from a, uh, you know, from a, a local history society to the World Shakespeare Company to the BBC to a um, solo participatory artist who makes their own living. Um, the key thing that we've been doing over the past few years is that we've been trying to shift the practice, the funded practice of research, and um, into a core focus on co-design and co-production of research questions and community-led research. So 10 years ago, KT, knowledge transfer, was a buzz thing. All right? Academics in universities had the knowledge, and lucky people outside were very lucky, and we assumed grateful, because we could occasionally, when it suited us, transfer our knowledge to them. And then we moved to KE, knowledge exchange, where there was a degree of dialogue between the two areas, between the two groups between universities and outside partner organisations. And what we're trying to do in Connected Communities is shift that along to the co-production, the co-production of research questions and agendas. Now that, you know, for some say, um, some disciplines that might not be terribly complex and, then, um, and there may well be a long tradition of it, so, you know, for example, in sociology. Uh, but for lots of arts and humanities subjects, and that's my real brief as a leadership fellow, is to uh, ensure the core and central presence of arts and humanities within and across the program. For lots of arts and humanities subjects, um, that, that sort of uh, collaborative external research is, uh, is a different way of doing things and is, uh, is uh, a challenge in its, own, in its own right. And so that's why we've uh, had the AHRC at the heart of things, because we're interested in getting arts and humanities scholars to change the way they think and work and to do other ways of research, to come back with other forms of practice and ideas. 
So Rick Rylands, who was the uh, chief executive until recently of the Arts and Humanities Research Council, has said at a, a recent, a recent uh, Connected Communities event, in five to 10 years, research will be produced between organizations, and not just by, say, the traditional Arts and Humanities model of a sole researcher working in an archive or a library on their own monograph or journal article and so on. Um, you know, I love that kind of research and I spend some of my time doing it and have done throughout my career. And the AHRC funds lots of that kind, that type of research, the traditional type, through responsive <coughs> mode funding. But we have a program like this to try and push what research might be for, us and for the arts and humanities. The scale of the program to date, we've made well over 300 awards. Well over means I'm not quite sure how many awards we've made. It could be 417, it could be 364. Uh, it's quite difficult after a few years in to kind of keep uh, control of it, as I think I'll, I'll be able to illustrate for you in a second. And they've ranged from small grants of 20 or 30,000 pounds up to 1.5 million pounds for some of the large projects, um, one or two of which you've heard about today, such as uh, the design, empowering design project earlier on. And, um, um, and we've funded around, I think, a dozen or so large grants i.e. those 1.5 million awards. And we're going to be announcing probably two new large grant a, uh, awards um, in the next month or two. Our total budget has been over 40 million pounds. So it's quite an investment from the Research Council in this rather experimental, actually, way of, uh, of, of doing research. Across these funded projects, we've been working with over 500 unique community partners. I don't know what unique means. I mean, you're all unique. We all are. And then, um, but I just took that off of the uh, AHRC little, you know, I can't face it actually. And then, um, but the word unique does worry me, but it might be like unique visitors to a website, something technical. Oh yeah, we've, uh, uh, in the early days, we, um, we commissioned over 70 scoping studies and we published them all on the AHRC website. But if you can't bear to go to the, to the website, even though it's brand spanking newly designed, um, do go to the Connected Communities ones website because it's much easier to search actually than the AHRC one is. And if you're uh, interested in pursuing a particular field for some sort of connected communities collaborative research idea and you want to see what's been done in, in the area in the last two or three years, the scoping studies, which are basically mostly reviews of current scholarship, the state of the art in the field, um, all of those are um, available for <coughs> reference. And usually, usually each scoping study will end with a set of research gaps, you know, and then uh, surprise, surprise, academics get funded to write review, and at the end of it, they say you haven't done enough research in my field, and then um, so give us more money. But nonetheless, that is one of the one of the key aspects of it. We've got all these research gaps at the end of each um, at the end of each scoping study. That's a useful way of uh, finding out more uh, about what's available and where the where the uh, where the gaps are. So a couple of years ago, we thought it would be a good idea to map the Connected Communities program. This is January 2014, so things have moved on. But you get a little bit of a sense of um, uh, uh, the, the scope of it here and complexity of it. And um, now if we had more, there would be three or four other colors over here with the 30 or 40 grant applications across it. Uh, grants funded across it, in fact. In order to address the complexity and breadth of the program, a couple of years ago when we designed the web, we designed our website, we categorized it. And um, I guess this is where most of your kind of projects are, but you can see actually there's a lot of cross cuttingness in the program anyway. <coughs> Research for community heritage. In 20, I think this is right, isn't it? In 2012, 21 universities were funded to explore partnerships with community groups through Heritage Lottery Fund, all our stories. Then a second phase of uh, projects began when the groups had been successful in their bids and started working with AHRC funded researchers. And before we know it, we've got 150 projects with collaborations between um, community and academic interests from music, the environment, history, archaeology, health, multimedia, oral history, archive, transport, many more across all regions of the UK. And then came the network, is that right, Nick? And then um, 
from our perspective, this is an achievement of the program. So we look to you and, and to the uh, uh, Heritage Network as one of our kind of um, successors. You know? And um, so that's another reason why I'm delighted to be here too. Connected Communities is about collaborative research. It's also about creating a community of scholars. You know, this, um, if we're trying to help and fund people to think about research in different ways and to practice it in different ways, there's not much point in doing that and then funding some early career researchers, ECRs, or PhD students, if they can't get a job at the end of it, you know. So they come up with these radical ways of working and then they go for a job in a traditional monodisciplinary department. And then the, you know, the chair of the interview panel says, yeah, it's lovely, we love what you're doing, it's cross-disciplinary, you're all blurring boundaries and so on, and we're going to appoint her, you know, because she fits our standard department, sort of template of what an academic should be. So we've been very much focused on creating a community of scholars, working to support our early career researchers. We've had highlight notices for CDAs, the Collaborative Doctoral Awards, so you know you can apply for a PhD studentship to work in collaboration with an external organisation. We funded research networks, we fund this network. We have an annual programme-wide gathering or an, an activity like a festival for award holders and for public engagement. We have follow-on funding mechanisms, if your grant's finished. And lots of them you can apply for further funding to do some other aspect of, uh, of uh, knowledge exchange. And we have large cross-institution project teams and we think we're um, responsive and flexible. And one of our recent uh, um, ways of trying to support our community is that we've launched a book series um, for projects and findings from cross-connected communities. The first book's been published last month, and the second one is out in a couple of months. And um, there's one from here, isn't there? Some people around? Yes, I think so. Some recent and current funding calls and activities. So I mentioned a moment ago that uh, we had probably two large grants that we're going to be announcing shortly. Well, you know, these things to, to, to award 1.5 million takes quite a long time to, to set that whole process up. And it goes back to a research development workshop around the, the theme of disconnection and cohesion i.e. a lot of the work that we've done up till then had a rather rosy and positive view of communities that we wanted to think about communities which might be disconnected. And, um, and so we set up this research development workshop over um, well over a year ago. And um, we're about to make the announcements for the large grant projects which will run for five years um, for, for those. In March, we have a a new conference for our early career researchers. So for any postdocs, for PhD students that are, that are linked with connected communities, <coughs> projects in some way, I hope you've seen the call for papers and then uh, talk a little bit more about it in a moment. Or if, you, um, if you're involved in a connected communities project and you can think of someone from one of your teams in the past or currently who has been a PhD student or is an early career researcher, then please forward the call for paper on, onto them because um, it's a terrific, it's a, it should be a terrific event. We've got a Communities in Utopia, London and Nationwide Festival in June, which is part of the Utopia 500 events. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Uh, we're doing some projects around reggae as a transatlantic musical community and culture, and um, that's a sort of research network around reggae music um, at, in Liverpool and London as well as UEF. And then we have a small the leadership fellows we kind of ask for a small amount of money each, and we call it a biscuit fund, and uh, so that we can support some um, initiatives, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second too. The Utopia 500 events this year, I've just listed them, um, so we, you know, we were sitting around a year or so ago and saying, God, 2016, that's the 500th anniversary of Thomas More, and at the time, uh, the publication in Latin of Thomas More's Utopia, at the time, I did some digging, and there didn't seem to be much going on. So I had a chat with AHRC, and uh, they gave us a budget to put some events together. And this is what we've come up with. And of course, you know, we didn't know at the time, but Somerset House were doing some amazing things as well, and so are lots of other people. So um, we've tried to kind of link some of our events together with some of theirs. And I know that um, 
uh, some people in the room have been have got applications in for the Community Futures and Utopias Nationwide Festival, and also for having a presence at the Utopia Fair at Sunset House. Both of those events in June, or leading up to June. And uh, well, the panel met this week, and the results of that panel will be announced um, shortly. And I've got this event in September. I just didn't want to lose sight of the way in which Utopia today, you know, has also been a space for you know the freaks and the cracks and uh, and the hippies and the uh, rabble rousers and the troublemakers and um, the squatters and the anarchists. And so I thought it would be nice if we could have them included somewhere. So I've got this idea for a conference or a gathering, a gathering at the UEA in September, which is provisionally called Utopian Dreamers, Activists and Experimenters. Um, I haven't told the VC yet, but I'm hoping it's going to be, not going to be too nervous if we get the kind of crowd that I hope we're going to get at it, but um, I'm sure it will be lively. Two minutes, okay. Some thoughts about our program's distinctiveness. I talked a little about this earlier, you know, we've got a distinctive contribution to our humanities and collective participation and collaborative research. That's what it's all about, really. Everything we do is about collaboration. Which brings me to my last slide, collaboration and opportunity. So I mentioned earlier that we have a, a biscuit fund that we've been given some money from AHRC and we will be um, uh, having two rounds of application <coughs> each year for, you know, these are for small sums. They're not for the PIs of grants, they're for ECRs or junior lecturers and uh, people that have been involved for researchers on, on uh, projects now or historically over the last few years who will be able to apply to do something um, new and specific and tightly focused with small amounts of money available up to 3k. We'll have two calls for that this year and two next year in June and December. I mentioned the Early Careers Researchers Conference. It's a free event in March, that means, and it means in good connected communities style that travel and accommodation are covered as part of it. And, uh, and it will also include some training and networking opportunities. So we hope to have some speakers from the National Council for uh, NCCP Public Engagement, from Claw Foundation, from VTI, talking about early career researchers and career structures and possibilities. Um, the deadline for that is the 2nd of February. And um, it's possible that there might be some a funding opportunity related to the event as well. I'm not sure yet, I'm just talking with AHRC about it. I figured if I said that in public, that might lend a bit more weight to them agreeing to give us a bit of money. We are interested um, in discussing further funding for the continuation of the Connected Communities Heritage Network. I've just written here, profile across the program. I think that was a point to me to, just, um, to say, um, yeah, we, you know, we really like this network and we think it's a great initiative and this is the third um, symposium that we've had and we're keen to support that. We sort of slightly feel that, if you look at the Connected Communities website, there isn't much of a presence for um, the Heritage Network on it. That's our fault, you know. So we've, in our minds, the leadership tells us, oh, that's great what they do. And then we haven't really translated that into a visible presence on the website terribly well. So we are going to address that, assuming that, you know, things move forward and that there's more funding. And then, but we'd also like the network to address it by giving us, say, a report or a version of the report so that <coughs> we can include that and um, to, it sort of talks to the, um, the presence and the profile of the network work more widely. But I could talk with, you know, we can talk with, with, uh, with Nick about that too. And, uh, and I'd also just say that it's current AHRC um, priority that there are key areas that um, have been identified for the next few years strategically. They are languages, design, and heritage. I put heritage in capital letters because I thought that was your thing. And, then, um, and uh, as I understand it, uh, the, there will be new leadership fellows to be appointed over this year for each of those priority areas. So um, in a kind of similar model to the kind of leadership fellows that most of the others have at the moment, which is to say on a 0.8 contract with 0.4 of your time on a leadership fellow role, and 0.4 on your own research, and that would be for three years. That's the kind of deal that all the other leadership fellows have. And the AHRC likes that model, likes having someone to kind of oversee a program and to offer advice and critique. And now that it's identified, carved out its three new priority areas, 
it wants to uh, push that side to have leadership developed in those roles over the city. So, the, so those would be some wonderful opportunities, I think, for um, for someone here, maybe, or for, for someone connected with your disciplines. Okay, thank you.